you know, all this technology is supposed to make things easier for us, right? Isn't that what they told us like 25, 30 years ago? The computers are going to make your life so wonderful. Now we have apps for everything. Apps that I didn't even have to worry about having an app for years ago because people took care of it. Now it's on me, right? How about, how about you guys? Understand that? And every piece of technology you pick up is like, like what do I do with this one? <laughs> uh, pull the button three seconds, five seconds, what do you do? And we all have like hundreds of passwords and all this stuff. Is it really better? Let's do it quick. I'm wondering. I'm wondering. Interesting world we live in today. So let's just pray this morning. Father, we thank you. Lord, we thank you for this time we have. God, that no matter what the world does, no matter how the world changes, your truth remains the same. Father, you said you are the same. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. You are the God who was, who is, and who is to come. God, we know that, that we can trust you, and it's a simple, easy thing. That we just trust you. It's, it doesn't require any kind of you know, special operation or understanding. It's just coming to you, acknowledging you, seeking you. You do a great work when we do that, Father. So we thank you this morning. I pray that as we open your word, Father, you would speak into our lives. You would let us uh, just receive great things from what the word says. Anoint my mouth to speak and all of our ears to hear, our hearts to receive. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, uh, crazy world, isn't it? I don't know if anybody out there is following anything that's going on. Our news says nothing, but you get to kind of dig a little bit and find out that China's rattling swords against us. They, were, they confronted our Navy in the Straits of Taiwan. Anybody, anybody hear that? Rich, I know you do. <laughs> you know, there's all kinds of stuff going on in the world. All they want us to do is look at the election or look at the, what this movie started. You know, most of our news is junk. This NFL player did this. Really? Who cares what they do in their personal life? They're athletes. They play a game. But what's going on in the world right now, you need to be aware of. Amen? You need to be aware of that we are living in the end times. Now, what that means as far as how long God will tarry, you know, we in America, we're on the, the downward slide of a culture, right? We are. Now, does it mean there's no hope? No, we can pray. We can pray that God brings revival and that God brings change. Amen? There's always hope for the Christian, for the people of God, because our God can do great and mighty things if we pray, right? It says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, that's repent, then I will hear from heaven forgive their sins and heal their land. You know, so God will do these things no matter how crazy the world looks, but it's, you know whose back it's on? Christ ultimately, but it's on his people to submit to him, amen, to repent. And if the church would rise up, listen, if Christians in this nation would rise up and take hold of the power of prayer, the power of coming together in agreement, would stop looking at their life, listen, if we don't stop Looking at this life, God's going to cause this life to change. Amen? It, the, what we have is going to change. The blessings that we have are going to change if we look at them. But he's calling us to look to him. We need to be a people that don't let the things of this world keep you from doing the things that God is telling you to do. Amen? I'm going to warn you sternly this morning because God put on my heart to do that. Get in his word. Get in prayer. Make God a priority above all other things, or you're going to see things happen. Listen, we're on a precipice. We're right on the edge of the world going haywire. We are. And it's only the prayers of God's people. And that's what amazes me, is God hears me. Amen? God hears you. I remember years ago, we used to watch a show called Fire by Night. And it was funny. They had a little skit about a family. It was, it was a comedy, but it was like a little mini sitcom of this Christian family. And they're not praying, and all this stuff's going on in the world. At that time, it was China and the Soviet Union under Gorbachev were having some issues, and they were, there was a, a threat of nuclear war at that time between them. This is back a long time ago, all right? We, we were young then, we and I were just married. We watched these shows. And uh, they're not praying, but they, they said, finally, they go, let's pray. And they start to pray specifically, and it's just this family. And they're praying, and then they show these scenes in the background, and it's like 
the Japanese or Chinese, whoever it was, and Gorbachev like shaking hands and being kind to each other and mm -hmm. trying to help each other. And, and we don't think that that can happen, but listen, your prayers affect, listen, our God is over all the things of this world. Amen. He rules over every nation, over every tongue, over every people, over every tribe. He is in control. He rules over Satan. So if God's people will get his ear and be serious about their walk with him, just like Jerry said, we have so many promises. The Bible is filled with probably thousands of promises. But they're conditional. And God promises to heal our land, but it's conditional. So I'm just bringing that up today because we do live in a time where we really need to pray, guys. Take this Christian walk seriously. Understand who you are. Time is short. People around you who don't know the Lord, if we get taken in the rapture, they will remain in seven years of, of a period of time that is like no other the earth has faced. I don't want my loved ones to face that. I don't want people around me to face that. And beyond that, if they die today, they face an eternity without God in a place where it says there is weeping and gnashing of teeth, where the worm, the fire is not quenched and the worm never dies. What does that tell you? Suffering. Forever. We are the answer to that problem because Christ has given us the ministry of reconciliation that tells us in 2 Corinthians. You are called to bring others back to him. Amen? So, so pray this way. And I'm not here to beat us up this morning, but God just put on my heart to share this. We can change what's going on. God can prolong. I wanted to give you one more update um, I received another email from my friend, this ministry we've been supporting in Pakistan. Listen, guys, the only reason I'm so excited about this is because we continue to send funds and God continues to move there. Amen? It's awesome what God is doing in Pakistan right now. So the last crusade they had, seven Hindu priests came. He was seven, if I'm correct. But I, I, I can look. But they, these Hindu priests came, and they came... They said, they called Jabed, and they said, we came to see if you were being critical of Hinduism because we were going to disrupt your meetings and cause you problems. Instead, they all got saved. Amen. They all heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, that there was redemption, that there was forgiveness of sins, that there was eternal life promised through God's Son by the blood that he had shed. And these seven Hindu priests came to Christ during that last crusade. They didn't know. You know, they don't always know who comes or who's there. These guys came, they let them know this, and then, get this, and you need, I need you guys to pray about this. They said, will you come in front of the Hindu temple and do a crusade? Yeah. So we sent funds last Sunday. We agreed to send funds to them. I didn't know this, and he didn't know this until this week. Those funds are going to go for that crusade that's going to be in front of a Hindu temple in Pakistan. Amen? Praise God. Pray about these things. We're not going. We're not there. But listen, your, your tithes and offerings have paid for these crusades. We've, we've been able to send money to, to Mike and, and Javed and, and these seven evangelists they have running around now on scooters, you know. But God is moving over there. And this is why he has not called us home yet. This is why the rapture has not happened. This is why he, he's long-suffering and waiting, because he's waiting for all these wonderful people who have never heard the gospel, who are coming in and getting saved right now, giving their life to Jesus. And you know, one day, you're going to be in heaven. Amen? I pray that everyone you hear know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You're going to be in heaven. And somebody who you don't know, with, with skin not the same as yours, or, or dressed differently than you, I don't know if we'll all get to dress the way we did here when we get there, but we don't know. But anyway, this person's going to come to you and go, thank you. Thank you for being obedient to give. Thank you, because I got saved in a crusade. I didn't know it, but you guys were funding that. Amen? Praise God. And it's not to boast. You know, we're not here to boast about it. I just want you to let you know what you guys did is going to further the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm excited. When I read that, man, that's, that's God. That's God moving. Amen? Amen? Seven Hindu priests. Most times, listen, my brother-in-law, Randy, was almost killed by Hindus in, in India. They mobbed them and started to push them around, beat them. If the police wouldn't have come, it was the same place where the Australian man and the missionary were burned to death in their car. So this is dangerous stuff. But when God wants to do something, God does it. Amen? God's powerful, and his will will always stand. There is no wisdom, there is no counsel against the Lord, it tells us in Proverbs. So, so I'm just kind of bringing these things up today before we jump into the Word. Pray, please. 
please pray. Pray for the church. Pray for our church. Pray for the church in America. Pray for the country. Repent on behalf of our country. Right? Yes. At the DNC, they had Planned Parenthood, Planned Parenthood basically glorifying the murder of babies in the womb. I'm, I'm sorry, guys. Abortion is not a birth control method. It's murder of a child within the womb. It's, that's the truth of it. Now, if you've experienced that, or you did that unknowing, you know, tri tricked into it, or, or, or fear, you know, gripped you, and you didn't know what to do, and you did it, God forgives you. You know, and you can come and get healing for that. God will heal your heart yeah. if you've been down that path. It's not something all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But as a, as a platform, as something to stand and say, this is okay, it's not okay. God will judge a land because of how they treat the innocent. And there's nothing more innocent than a baby in the womb. Amen? Amen. A heartbeat being stopped. They won't let people see the, the films that they have of the baby pushing away the vacuum tube when they go to vacuum the baby out of the womb, grabbing it and, hold, and trying to push it away. They won't show people that stuff, but it's very real. This is what we need to repent on behalf of our land for and pray. Listen, pray, pray, pray. Will you also, through your tithes and offerings, support House of His Creation and Deeper Still Ministry? That's, that's for... Young women who decide to keep their, their child, that have no other resources, can go. There's two girls right now, one's due this week. You know, the Joe and Trisha ministry, too. Praise God for that. It's another life saved. Because they had no other option, but they came there and they get a place to stay. You help fund that. Amen? That, that's so important. Deeper still, Trish does they have a, a, crusade, or, or a conference coming up, a retreat where they will get people to come, people who need healing from the fact that they have had abortions and deal with that guilt. And, and Trish, invite them to come where they can come and get healing and get ministry and get deliverance and be set free. And the only reason Trish does that is because she had two abortions. And her life was miserable, even as a Christian, until she came to grips with it and realized that God forgave her. She receives healing. Amen. So that's what your your funds do. So when you give your offering, guys, it's not just money that's going to be. Steve told me that this year so far, fifty percent of what has come into this church has gone out on missions. Fifty percent. I'm not saying that to boast. I'm just saying glory to God. Amen. Let's just give God a hand. Thank you. Very much. God has blessed us. So, you know, it's important to see what, what your, you know, ties do. You know, of course, it's just building open and clean and, and updated and all those kind of things, too. But primarily, we want to minister, right? We want to use what we have because God's blessed us all, all of us here. Whether you're the poorest person in this room, you're still blessed compared to 95% of the rest of the world. Amen. You're living in a, a, a situation that's much better than they are. So, you know, we can we can send this out. So, Father, we just thank you, Lord. Thank you. So we've been in First Corinthians, and First Corinthians, I think, is a timely book to be in. It's a timely thing to look at because the church, even though they had a lot going on for them, they had been taught richly the word of God. They had the gifts moving, and said that you know they were lacked in no gift. Um, in chapter one, they were taught. Paul spent a lot of time there teaching them. They had all this resource. And again, Corinth was a blessed city, very blessed. You know, they had all kinds of trade. It was a, a primary city in the Greek peninsula. They were struggling with the things I'm talking about, sexual immorality, you know, fleshliness, just junk, right, that, that, that the church here in America is facing today too, mostly because they were affluent. Listen, when, you, when everything's good, it's easy to sin, right? When everything's... When everything, when you got lots of money in your pocket, that's why it says it's harder for a rich man, or, or you know, it's difficult for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said that not because riches are bad; it's just the fact that if you set your eyes upon riches, they can take you places you never want to go. Plus, it makes it easy to become idle and to do things that you don't you can do. And so, 
that's what happened in Corinth. So Paul's addressing them and, and, and hitting on these things that, that need to be corrected. We saw that there was division in the church. And they were listening to, you know, what seemed to be wisdom or intellectual information that was God's name was being put on, but it really wasn't the meat of the gospel. It wasn't really something that was changing their lives. How many know you can you can actually study a lot of theology and really have it never change your life? Amen? There are people that are experts in theology, but they never never let it go from here to here. They can talk about all the incredible ways that the, the Bible was written and preserved and you know all the ways that, that it is, is, is historically proved and all these things. But those things do not change your heart. It's only when you come and humble yourselves and are broken before Christ and repent of your sins and let the gospel do its work that you, are, you become changed. It's a heart matter, not a head matter. There's a lot of smart people. In fact, I listen to people who aren't even Christians. There are some, some you know, different guys who have either a podcast or they have a, a radio show or they're prominent in conservative speech. And uh, they're, they're, some of them are Jewish and they don't know Christ as Savior. But they, they get all the moral issues. They get all the stuff that, that supports a good moral life. right? They, they understand all that, but they aren't saved. They don't know God. And see, the primary thing, that's why Paul said, I came knowing nothing among you except Christ and Him crucified because it's a stumbling block to the Greek, foolishness to the Greek, and stumbling block to the Jews. Remember we read that. And, and so he was dealing with this fact that people were coming in and puffing them up with a lot of knowledge, but they were losing sight of the value of Christ changing their hearts, the, the value of Christ ruling as king in their life. Amen? That's what's important. Not how much I know, but how much I know him. Amen? And I only come to know him through relationship with him, through humbling myself before him, through the cross of Christ. So that's where we were. And, you know, it, basically it says that the natural person, that's where we ended up last week at the end of chapter 2, the natural person cannot understand the things of the Spirit. It's amazing. You can have all this intellectual head knowledge, but really not understand the way in which God's Spirit moves. Or understand what what the power of God is in the simplicity of praying and watching him move by his spirit. Amen? We like to have formulas, right? We like to have ways that, that make sense to us intellectually instead of just believing that God's going to take care of it, right? We want to figure it all out. We got a problem? I've got to, I've got to figure out all the steps I need to take care of this problem. And what resources do I have to attack this problem instead of going, wait, I have one place to go. To the, to the one who knows it all. And then spiritually, God is able to do things in the background. Like we were saying the song this morning, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. He never stops working. That's a spiritual thing that God is doing. And, and many of us, we beat our heads against the wall, and we pray too. And then when God finally answers it, we go, why was I beating my head against the wall over this? If I would have just waited and trusted God in this, he was going to move no matter what. And all of my efforts, all they ever did, was frustrate the situation. So that's what we see, is that, that God, that the spiritual can only be understood by those who are spiritually discerning things because they've been born again. You're not going to understand God. That's where we ended up last week. You're not going to understand the Bible. You're not going to understand the way that God moves if you are not born again of the Spirit of God. You have to be born again of the Spirit to understand God to understand his word. So that's where we were. He says that we have the mind of Christ. No one can understand the mind of the Lord. No one can instruct him. But we have the mind of Christ. If you're saved, you have the mind of Christ. You just have to begin to use it. You need to think the way that God thinks. It's a spiritual way of thinking. It's not my natural way of thinking. It's a spiritual way of thinking. So here in chapter 3, Paul's going to continue to address this, this thing about them being divided. <laughs> He says, well, brethren, I could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you milk and not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you are not ready, for you are still of the flesh. 
For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another says, I follow Apollos, Apollos, are you not being merely human? What Paul is trying to point them to is that when there's strife, when there's jealousy, when there is anger, when there are these things that work in a church or a person or any of our lives, it's from the flesh. And even as a pastor, listen, sometimes I say things from the flesh up here. Forgive me, because I'm still in this body of flesh. Sometimes I get excited about something, and I might say something, maybe you feel like, oh, that was a little bit condemning. Probably because it's coming from my flesh. Hopefully, I pray, Lord, please keep that to a minimum, right? I want to, want to keep to a minimum any of me. Less of me and more of you, God. But, but when it's of the flesh, it only stirs up fleshly reactions. And we see that when you begin to put people on pedestals, or you begin to, you know, have a church that's divided, or we, we start to look at uh, the, the, the doctrines of the church, things that are not of the Word of God, and we let them guide us either through jealousy or pride or anger or hatred, that's not, that's not God working. That's not the, the, the meat of God's Word. is never going to lead us to that kind of outcome. Amen? The meat of God's word is going to lead us to love. The meat of God's word is not deep spiritual things that some people talk about. You know, some people are always like, we're going to go hear these deep spiritual messages. This, this guy speaks of deep spiritual things. You know what the deepest spiritual thing that can happen in your life is? You die into your flesh and letting the Spirit of God fill and guide your life. That's all the deeper we need to go. God will show you deep things and interesting things in the Word. The thing I found, and we were praying this morning, is that God's Word doesn't get more deep to me. God's Word gets more woven together and so beautiful. We were talking about, I was praying this morning, I was reading, Lori and I were here, and I thought about everybody over here with scarlet thread. Anybody ever hear that term, scarlet yes. thread? Scarlet thread is the story of Christ throughout the Bible, right? You can follow it from the beginning through it. We call it the scarlet thread. The deeper I get in Christ, it's no longer a thread. It's a tapestry. It's all these incredible, woven together, beautiful things that God has made his word to be. That's the depth of God's word. And it's, it's how it's applied in my life, how it's changing me into his image, Amen. That's the deep things of God. You know, the deepest thing is, like I said, is me dying to myself and letting Christ live in me. That's so deep. Yes. Because that's what Jesus is all about. He's transforming us into his image. So, you know, I, I think it's important for us to not fall into divisions, especially if it's jealousy. Like, they have it and I don't. Or, you know, pride, where I have it and they don't. These are things we want to get out of our lives. Mm -hmm. we, want, we want to be a people that love one another. When I look around, when I look at the church, my heart needs to be what's guiding me, not my head. There was a commentary I was going to pick up this morning, and I went to grab the commentary when I was, when I was studying, and I said, you know what, I'm not going to pick that up, because that one gentleman, I'm not going to say his name, because I don't need to, is a person who spreads a lot of hatred. He's a very intellectual teacher, incredible Bible scholar. But man, does he come down hard upon anybody who believes in the gifts of the Spirit today. And it's amazing because this guy's commentary is so good all the way through until you get to chapter 13 of this book. And then he does the exact thing that he says we shouldn't do. His hermeneutics fall apart. He starts pointing fingers and telling stories. And I'm like, that's not biblical, man. You didn't, you didn't go, you didn't follow your own advice. Those are the things that I don't want to be that person, amen? I want to look at the Word of God. And even if I understand some truth about God's Word, I don't want to bring it to somebody in hatred or that brings division or that sets a wall in between me and that person, amen? And isn't that what we see happening in the body of Christ so many times? We develop walls, denominational walls, ideological walls. We don't want to do that. And that's what Paul was fighting here. He's saying, look, it's not about who's 
of Apollos or who's of Paul. It's about who's of Jesus Christ and who is letting Christ conform them, conform them into his image. The milk of the word is the, the thing of repentance and of me coming to Christ and of dying to myself. That's the milk of the word. The meat of the word is Christ being developed in me and me showing forth the proof of my sanctification. That's the meat of the word. And the meat of the word, the fleshly Christian will choke on. Why? Because they're walking in the flesh. It's offensive to them. It's offensive to them. When I say that you are to forgive those who have hurt you, and you're a, a baby Christian, you're an immature Christian, you're a Christian walking in the flesh, you're like, no, I'm not forgiving them. Right? That's because you're walking in the flesh. Or you need to give this up. I'm not giving that up. Right? Isn't that what babies do? No, mine. Right? Give me that toy, it's gonna hurt you. You know, this give me those scissors, child. You know, no, mine. It's like, you know, they're dangerous. But that's how that's how baby Christians are. And the milk is correction. I have to take them from you and correct you, right? That that's the milk. That's what babies get. But the meat is when I've come beyond the place of, of resisting Christ and of resisting change. It's coming to the place of being humble and broken where I can receive the truths that transform my life. Amen? And it's a place of brokenness. It's a place of admitting I'm wrong. It's a place of looking at my life and saying, these things are not conducive to my growth. Amen? These things are not that important. I have not grown beyond this point. Why? Why am I at this point in my Christian walk where I keep running up against the wall and I'm not growing? Probably because there are things in your life that you're not getting rid of. You're still attached to the fleshly desires and things of this world. All of us, from me on through every person here. The growth occurs when we give up this life. Amen? Jesus said, if any man want to follow me, then take up his cross and follow me. It's crucifying the flesh. So, so Paul's chastising them, saying, look, you're not ready for the, the meat of the word because you're still in the flesh. How did Paul know? Because they're fighting. There's jealousy. There's anger. There's fear. They're upset. They can't, you know what I mean? How do we know we're in the flesh? Is when we are losing it one way or another, right? Come on. We all do it. Don't look at me like that. Not me. We all lose it sometimes. And we know, and hopefully it becomes less and less, right? And it's funny because sometimes God will take us through deeper and deeper trials to kind of sift all that stuff out of us. Right? He gets the first things out of us when we get saved, and he works in our lives. But he's, he's taken us through different periods of our lives. And sometimes the time periods for answers to come become longer. Why? Because he needs to have that time period there to expose the things in your life that need to go. But the mature person of God the one will receive those things gladly. You're looking to hear the Lord. The Bible says, Draw near to me, and I will draw near unto you. The mature Christian will draw near to God. The mature Christian will run to the Word. The mature Christian will seek Him in prayer. The mature Christian will come and worship Him and be broken before Him. It doesn't mean you're a perfect Christian. It's just you're mature because you've realized that the meat of God's Word is what changes who I am into His image. Not just save me, thank you God, I'm saved, now I'm just going to go live my life the way I want to. That's a baby Christian. Every problem I've ever come up with in church, and sometimes it's from people who appear to be super spiritual, right, are those who are walking in some kind of strife, anger, jealousy, pride. It's just hidden. It's hidden in an I know more than you kind of attitude. But listen, you can't remain in that. Because I've seen those kind of people over time fall and fail. And it may take time. You might look at somebody and say, well, they're getting away with this. Nobody gets away with anything. I want to tell you that right now. Right? Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he reap. How many know that in the law of sowing and reaping, time is the essence there. 
and you put that seed in the ground, it takes a while before, oh, that kind of thing popped out, right? And when it pops out, it takes a while before those two little tiny seed-shaped leaves fall off and the, the actual look of the plant comes forth. And then it takes a while longer before that plant gets large enough for the fruit of what was sown to come forth. So don't think you're ever getting away with anything when we're sowing things that are ungodly in our lives or, or we have problems and we're not dealing with them. They're always going to catch up with us. I don't, I don't like that as much as you. Prosperity. Oh, jeez. Yeah. But I don't like it either. But So what do we do? We repent of them. We stay close to God. And you're like, well, I'm just struggling with the same thing and I'm afraid of, of reaping. Just keep sowing into God's righteousness in your life. Keep sowing into the fruit of the Spirit in your life, right? By dying to your flesh. One wonderful thing about the flesh is that if you starve it, it dies. And if you starve it, anything you planted in it dies too. How many know if you don't water that nice little plant that you planted? Anybody ever do that? Like, oh, I forgot I put those things in that egg shell or in that egg carton those tomato plants or whatever you're starting. I forgot about those. You go over and they're dried up and guess what? There's no life. Even though there was life in that seed, it sprouted, but because it wasn't taken care of, it died. That can apply to both good and bad. Things are your flesh. If you don't feed your flesh, even though those seeds were planted there of evil, if you don't feed it, if you don't water it, it'll dry up and die. And the fruit won't come. Amen? The fruit of those evil things, same thing in the spirit. On the other side, if you plant and sow good seed into your life, but you're not watering it, and you're not filling yourself up with, with the, the water of God's word, the, the sunlight of his Holy Spirit shining on you, if you're not doing that, then the same thing can happen there. The seed of God's word in your life sprouted, right? We know that all about the four soils that Jesus taught in the parables of the four soils, and the one sprouts up on stony ground and it has no root. And it dries up and dies. We need to let God change us. That, this is what mature Christians do. And when we do that, you know what you find out? As you let Christ crucify your flesh and deal with the issues of your life, all of a sudden you get along with other people better. People different than you. People who aren't the same as you. Don't have the same interests. People at church that are totally, you guys are from opposite ends of the, of the world, right? You know, opposite ends of the, the culture you live in. Maybe you're affluent and they're not, or they're intellect, you're intellectual and they're just, you know, somebody who's never even went to eighth grade. But, but you find out, hey, there's a new creation in both of us that have the same Father, and we're both agreeing upon the need for the things of the Spirit to be at work in our lives. And you begin to love one another. You begin to, to put up with each other. You let the things of the Spirit work in your life. The mature Christian knows how to bear with the weaknesses of the weak. The mature Christian doesn't react in the flesh. That's what Paul was addressing here. They, they had all this teaching, and they even had the gifts of the Spirit. We're going to get to chapter 12, 13, 14, and 15, and see that the, the things of the Spirit were operating in their midst. In fact, in chapter 1, he says to them, you lack in no gift. He's talking about the gifts he's going to touch on. Tongues, prophecy, healing. They were moving in the things of the Spirit. But I can tell you right now, I grew up in the time of the 1970s when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the church. I saw people filled with the Spirit, praying for others, but I've seen some of those same people fall away from God and, and not walk in the fullness of the fruit of the Spirit. And they had the gifts, and they had you know, the power, and they had the excitement in their lives. But that's not enough. That's why it's called a gift of the Spirit, because you did nothing to get it. But the, the, in Galatians 5, it talks of what? The fruit of the Spirit that is planted within you and is cultivated by being planted in the right place. Getting watered and getting the sunlight. Staying in that place where you're being healthy as a Christian. Amen? That's what we all need. So Paul's chastising him here, saying, you guys are still in the flesh. You're not understanding these things. There's, there's all these things that are going on in, your, in the midst that I have to deal with. And the bottom line is, you didn't grow. You're still sucking on the bottle. Right? Isn't that, 
Hey, you ain't that when you see a kid four years old. So, still drinking out of a bottle and wearing a diaper. Five year old kid. It's cute when they're little. Oh, look at a tiny diaper. Look how cute they are. And bring them to the hospital. A little diaper is this big. <laughs> Barely fit. Their little skinny legs just stick out. It's cute then. They oh, they made a poo poo. It's so nice. <laughs> but if they're five years old and you're putting a diaper on them, it's not fun anymore. It's not cute. And that's how it is in the church. You know, it's not cute that Paul, having spent a year and a half of his life at Corinth, has to go back and deal with these jealousies and division and issues in the church because they hadn't grown in the knowledge of Christ. They looked at the wrong things. Yeah. I told you, man, I grew up in charismatic church. And one thing I noticed about that, that era, the era of that era, error of that error. How's that? <laughs> um, was a neglect of God's word. There were people I would hear preaching things that were based on a scripture, but, but that scripture would be turned into someone's own understanding of this one portion of scripture. They didn't teach verse by verse out of the Bible. They didn't deal with these difficult subjects. And that, that's the sad part. We need both the water of God's word, understanding of God's word, and the sunlight of the power of His Holy Spirit. We need both. Amen? If it's all sunlight, what does that do? It dries up that plant. If it's all water, what happens? It rots. You need the water and the Spirit. You need the word and the moving of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And willing hearts, soil that's going to receive that and grow into mature Christians. Amen? Yeah. Amen? So that's what we really want to do. Take it seriously, guys. God wants us to grow up into this household. God wants us to grow up into his people. He wants us to become. Listen, everybody here has a call in their lives. I'm not the only one. The pastor's not the only person called by God. Oh, he's a man called of God, and he's fulfilling that in the pulpit. Well, guess what? There's probably five other people here who are going to preach or teach, or six or eight people. I don't know how many of you, God. I see it in some of you. And God's calling you. Some of you have the gifts of help and administration. Some of you have the gift of healing. Some of you have the gift of giving. It's amazing what God puts in each one of us when we have to grow up and get rid of our flesh. We don't even know what we have when we're concentrating on our flesh. How can I understand my spiritual value if I'm stuck in my flesh? Put yourself, listen, you need to be a part of the body of Christ. You need to be here. You need to be here and make a commitment to be in church. You need to be a people who are seeking after God and making him, like Jerry brought up this morning, Let's say, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. And one of my other favorite verses is, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these other things will be added up to you. You know, these promises that Jerry was talking about this morning, same thing. It's for the mature, those who will listen to God's word and honor it. Amen? And then we grow. Why do we have so many battles in our lives? Why do we have so many issues in our lives? It's because we've not learned who we really are. Amen? We've not learned who the man of the Spirit or the woman of the Spirit is within us. And that only comes by dying to ourselves and then finding out the depths of the things of God. You need to be in His Word. You need to grow. He says, what is Apollos? What is Paul? They're only servants in whom we believe. As the Lord assigned to each, I planted Apollo's water, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and the one who waters are one. Each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field and God's building. So he's saying that. We are God's field. We are each plants. He says that we are trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. Amen? It tells us that in the Old Testament. You are trees of righteousness. Trees of righteousness produce the fruit of the Spirit. Amen? We are trees of righteousness, planting of the Lord. And, and Paul says, look, people who are ministers, 
my job is not to be exalted by any man. My job is to recognize I am a slave of Christ. That's what that serve. I am, I am a, a servant of Christ. We don't like to throw that word around today. Everybody gets offended when you say slave. It's amazing because, listen, there are more actual human slaves today than there were in 1850. And there's more in this country right now. Think of the population of this country and the amount of human trafficking that's going on right now. In this world, there are more slaves today from every type of race of people that are being used, abused. So don't be offended when I say slave. But I'm a slave to Christ. He owns me, and I do his will. I do his bidding. And that's what Paul said. Look, I'm just a servant. I'm just a lowly, that, that word there is a lowly servant. One who does menial tasks. What I do is just what God would want me to do. And all of us, we need to have that mentality. We're just servants. But God is the one who's at work. Any good thing we see in our lives, any good thing in the church, any good thing happening in the church at large, don't look at that person and say, oh, that must be them. That's God doing it. We talk about Pakistan. What's going on over there? Is it Mike? Is it... Uh, Javed, the guy who's over there? No, it's God deciding that right now is the time and the soil is ripe and these two are willing and God is working. They are just the servants that God is using. And he's using you because of the funds that, you use to, that you've, we've sent to help them. We're just servants. You have to keep that idea there that you know we're all part of this. Every one of us helps with God's field. It's not just Paul and Apollos here. All of us are helping. You, you know, you may not have 20 people listening to you, but you probably have a few. Amen? All of us influence somebody's life. God has given you a position in someone's life to speak the truth of Christ into them. God has given you that. Use it. Use it. You might think, oh, it's just my parents. They're such a pain, or whatever it might be. I'm thinking of Becky, you know. Jeez, oh man, what go on? But God has given you that right now to be the, the minister of Christ as a family to them. And God, they're important to God. Amen? So, so and we, and we join along and pray with you. But the, you see, every one of us, it's not just a pulpit that makes a difference. All of you have people in your life who you are called to minister to. You need to do it. You need to do it. And you need to realize that God will use you. If you are willing to serve him in that way, big or small, listen, if I'm a servant, it doesn't matter if God tells me, go clean the toilets, or God tells me to go deliver a, a you know a million dollars to somebody, right? Something big task, you think, oh, he's carrying a million dollars. It's no different, right? It's still just a task. I don't know the difference between whether I'm carrying a million dollars or a a box of donuts, right? It doesn't really matter. It's just, am I willing to do what God tells me to do? Just servants. And Paul's saying, that's all human Apollos for. Don't put men on, on pedestals. Don't put yourself on a pedestal. Realize, we're just serving God. And let's praise God for what he does. Paul said, look, don't look at me. Look at what God's doing in me. That's why I think it was so cool that God used Paul. Because Paul was Saul. The worst offender of persecution against the church, a life that had no value. If we if we could think of somebody today, it wouldn't take very long to think of a, a current person in in uh, power that we don't like. Right? It's easy to think of somebody right away. And just think if God changed their life, who would get the glory? You would only have to say there is no way what God did that. Amen. But we don't see it. We just see the Apostle Paul from this side of things, right? From, from 2,000 years later, what God did through him. But in that day, he was nothing man, to the church. They didn't trust him at first. They, they, they were like, we hate this guy. And he's a Christian now? I'm not sure. How many of us do that? You see so and so get saved. We're like, I don't know. You know, that guy. Maybe not. Sometimes we're right. But, but sometimes we're totally wrong. And God's doing the work. But Paul realized that God just used him. He was a vessel. Now, he was obedient. There's some, some things we didn't think of there. He trusted God and did what he was told, right? But, but God was able to move powerfully through him because he realized he was a servant of the Lord. We're all called to be servants. 
He says, according to the grace that God had given me, that like a skilled master builder, I had laid a foundation. Someone else is building on it. Let each one take care of how he builds. So Paul starts to get into, you know, what, what we need to do to build a healthy church, to, to realize that the foundation is laid in Christ. I'm not going to go there today. I'm going to stop. But I really want you to think about the fruit of the Spirit in your lives. That if there's strife in your relationships, in your marriage, in your home, in your church, if there's strife, if there's jealousy, if there's anger, if there's a problem between you and somebody, you who know Christ should not be the source of that. Amen? You should not be the source of it. It's time for us to grow up. Amen? Is there somebody that you're not talking to? Is there somebody that you're not in relationship with? Is there somebody that you're at odds with? If there is, you need to repent. Because you're walking in the flesh. You're walking in the flesh. And God doesn't want us to walk in the flesh. God wants us to walk in the spirit. God wants to produce good things in us. Because listen, if you're doing that in your home, it'll spill over into the church. We all affect one another. Amen? Yes. The body of Christ. You know, when my toe hurts, my whole body hurts. My tooth hurts, my whole head hurts, right? It's this little tiny cavity right here, this little tooth, right? You ever have that? And it feels like it starts hurting. It feels like your whole head's going to explode. Or you have a headache? You have a headache? Your stomach starts to get sick, right? All these things are connected. That's why it's important that we listen to these kind of messages say, man, I want to be part of being a servant to Christ, of honoring him, of dying to myself, of recognizing what he wants me to do, and above all, loving people. Amen? That's, you know, the number one fruit of the Spirit is what? What's the first word when God in Galatians 5 talks about the fruit of the Spirit? Love. 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 And I, I truly believe that that he puts that first because all the rest of them are aspects of love. Amen? Patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, all those things that are there. Faithfulness, they're all part of what love produces in us. I don't know why. Man, I missed so many of my notes today. God just had me go a certain way. I hope it ministered to somebody today. Absolutely. But... I wrote this down as a note. I said, the mature Christian understands unity at all costs. The mature Christian understands unity at all costs. Because that's what God did. God understood that for reconciliation and unity to occur between him and mankind, it would cost him everything. And it cost him everything. For me to walk in that kind of unity and to have that kind of effect in other people's lives, it's going to cost me dying to myself and living for Christ. I said, they understand that it is truly a body. They know love. Amen? It amazes me today. I look out there, I see places that say, love is love is love. Or God is love. Love is not unrighteous. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing. Right. Anything that God describes as being wrongdoing, love does not put its approval on. Doesn't mean it's still not there as love, but it's not saying that's okay. That's what the world's trying to say love is. Love, love is saying whatever you want to do, just do it, and I'm not going to bother you now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Love will walk with people in their brokenness and, and plead with them to come to righteousness and help to correct them. But it will never rejoice in anything that's wrong. Amen? Don't get me wrong here, but we want to be full of God's love to the point where we're not letting the, the, the works of the flesh come out. I can be upset about evil and then in my flesh react to it, right? And that's when hatred comes out. But love, listen, Love can look at wrongdoing, not approve of it, 
but still be loved and still bring comfort and still try to reach that person who's walking in the wrong way of living. Amen? That's what we need to be. We need to be loved. So let's just pray that we would not be a people that cause disunity. Amen? Whether it's in our families, our homes, our workplace. I've fallen guilty of that many times. Are you out there in your workplace being a divider instead of a unifier? The older I've gotten, I've gotten much better at that. People start taking me down this road. This guy did that, and this person doing this. I'm like, hey, hey, wait, wait a minute. I don't even know what they're doing. All I know is we need to get this done right now. You know, where before I'd fall into it, I'd be like, yeah, you're right. That guy doesn't know what he's doing. And I'd go over to Jeff. Yeah, Jeff, you know that guy's doing this, right? And, and before you know it, we're all right at work. Come on, we don't want to be that person anymore. Amen? I'm telling you, I was that person. Even as a Christian, even as a pastor, I would let those things get me. And they still try. But man, the more I let God's love fill my life, the more I let the truth of God's word fill me, the more I recognize when I'm walking in the flesh and I'm not a unifier or a divider. We don't want that, amen? So let's pray this morning. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we just ask, Lord, that you would bring to mind to every person here situations in their life, relationships in their life, Anything that's hindering the unity of the body of Christ or the unity of, of their family or the unity of, of brothers and sisters in the Lord, that they would just renounce it today and say, God, I'm going to make this right. I know it's not going to solve it. It's not going to make the, the issue go away, but I'm going to be okay with them and I'm going to love them and I'm going to pray for them and I'm going to pray that this issue gets resolved. I'm going to do the right thing. Amen. Let's just pray that today. God, help us to walk in unity. Lord, help me to see other people in the body of Christ who love you as co-workers, not as enemies. And Lord, we may not agree on everything. Maybe we don't have a different understanding or we haven't come to a level of understanding of the things of you. But we wouldn't be hateful towards our brothers and sisters in Christ that have a different opinion. Not in the essentials. As your word says, God, that we are to have essentials in, in what we believe. Apostle Paul preached that. But there are things that are not important that, that, that they can grow into. Lord, help us to be wise to those things. Help us to be a people that bring healing and hope and light. Father, I pray that this morning that, that we wouldn't fall into fleshly living, but we would live and grow in the things of the Spirit. Father, I pray that for everyone here, and if anyone prayed that because of a situation in their life, if they prayed that today, that, that they've got, they want to change what they've been doing. They want to change how they've been reacting. They want to change the way they've been unforgiving towards someone. Father, I pray right now in Jesus' name that that power of darkness be broken off of their life this morning. That unforgiveness and the power it holds over them would be broken in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And all the filth that comes with it. Because listen, unforgiveness breeds all kinds of other problems in our lives. So God, we, we just break the power of that this morning. As we say, uh, I forgive that person. You can say it right now, Lord, I forgive so and so. You don't have to say it out loud. You can say it under your breath. That you're, you're, I forgive them and I'm going to make it right. I'm telling you, there's issues in your life because you're not forgiving. You need to have it broken this morning. Forgive that person. Let love flow in your life. Yes. Let the love of God say, Lord, help me to love that person. I'm going to tell you right now, if you start praying for God to give you the ability to love somebody, it's amazing. It will come. It will come. If you renounce the wickedness, if you renounce unforgiveness, if you renounce the dividing issues, jealousy, whatever it might be, pride, if you renounce those things and begin to pray, Lord, help me to love like you love, you'll see a change. So, Father, we pray that this morning, Lord. We want to love like you love, Jesus. We want to be righteous as you are, Lord. We want to stand for the right and hate the sin, but we want to love those around us, God. We want to show that they can come to Christ, that they can come and be received into the kingdom. Now, they all have to come through repentance and, and, and through faith, but, but not by our anger. We know that the the anger of man can't produce the righteousness of God. 
So, Father, we just pray this morning. Heal us. Heal us, I pray. Lord, I pray for marriages this morning. Jesus, I pray for marriages. Jesus, please help the marriages in this church and the marriages throughout the body of Christ. We pray for them this morning, Lord. We pray for families this morning, God, for between children and parents, that there be reconciliation in families, Lord. In church friendships or people maybe that we know within the body of Christ. God, we pray for healing in that this morning, God, in the name of Jesus. That those who are walking in pride or in, you know, in a way that is wrong or in error and they won't forgive their brother or or they look down upon others in the church. God, forgive them. Forgive us, Lord. God, make, make a way in us to, to just be so filled with the love of Christ, I pray. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 How many feel that you're going to see something different in your life? Because we prayed this this morning. I hope, I hope it ministers somebody. Uh, uh, I don't know if you'll be able to hear me. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking of these verses that as Paul was talking, Jesus in Matthew 9, 6, he's telling them they get mad because he heals someone on, on a Sunday. He says, get up, your sins are forgiven. He says, so that you'll know the Son of Man has the power to forgive. We're given that same power. Christ in you can forgive others. So where else did he see this? On the cross. On the cross, he prays, Father, forgive them. You know, not what they do. It's just what Stephen said when he was getting stoned to death. Father, don't hold this against them. So you've got that power. So don't let yourself be angry. So many people are going through doing your battles against flesh and blood. Then in John 20, 23, he's given the great commission. He says, if you forgive the sins of any, then they're forgiven. If you retain the sins, they're not forgiven. If we have the power to have God forgive someone for what we're doing, they're doing, Father, we won't do it. Amen. Amen.